Good morning from WKYT News. I'm Bill Bryant and welcome into May. Later, WKYT investigative reporter Miranda Combs will join me with more on her story of a sheriff allowing his 10-year-old son to sign some official documents. And how does WKYT find the stories that we look more deeply into? That's a little bit later, but first, Attorney General Andy Bashir is here. It's been a busy first few months on the job for the Commonwealth's top prosecutor. As he expected and campaigned on, Bashir has been busy with addressing child abuse, the state's horrible problem with drug addiction, and establishing a specific effort aimed at protecting senior citizens from scams. What was not anticipated by the press or the public is the bitter back and forth between Governor Matt Bell and the Attorney General Bashir and his father, former Governor Steve Bashir. The Attorney General has sued the Governor over his ability to cut higher education in the current year. He has issued opinions that Bevan overstepped his authority in removing board members. This week, the Attorney General asked the Ethics Commission to look into whether the Bevan administration has fired people based on campaign contributions. All of this after a guilty plea from a man who served in Steve Bashir's administration and briefly in Attorney General. Bashir's office. A lot to discuss with Attorney General Andy Bashir. We welcome you and thanks for coming in. Well, thanks for having me. So again, a long list and a lot has been happening lately uh, and is, uh, has been said lately. Uh, Tim mm -hmm. Longmire uh, pled guilty to accepting $200,000 in kickbacks in federal court. Uh, he was mm -hmm. the personnel secretary under your father's administration. It was deputy attorney general in the first weeks mm -hmm. of your administration. Uh, you have said that you are told that it had nothing to do with your office and you had no knowledge of it. Well, that's right, and it's not just me hearing it. The United States attorney, Kerry Harvey, has gone on record not once but twice, Bill, uh, and said that uh, Mr. Longmire's actions had nothing to do with either me or the attorney general's office. And neither uh, I nor the attorney general's office are involved in any way uh, in that investigation. Uh, we have been fully cleared. Uh, but let me say that public corruption uh, is critical and very important uh, to the Office of Attorney General. We are the top office charged with prosecuting public corruption. And that's why you've seen in the last couple weeks uh, us accept guilty pleas uh, and or indict numerous public officials uh, from the Science Hill police chief uh, to the Lee County circuit clerk who's going to be paying back hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, to me and to this office, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you've worked, uh, if you've broken the law, you should be brought uh, to justice. And that's exactly how the office is going to continue. Uh, and that's why the United States uh, uh, attorney statements uh, are so critical, because uh, it allows us to get back to work. Uh, to holding other public officials accountable and ultimately focusing on addressing child abuse, drug abuse, uh, better protecting our seniors, uh, and, and seeking justice for victims of rape. After Longmire's guilty plea, mm -hmm. uh, do you look back and think, is there something uh, you should have asked <laughs> in your interview uh, when you brought him onto your staff? Uh, you know, I've had a number of those conversations, and uh, folks in law enforcement um, ha have even told me that looking back, they don't think that there is any way uh, that I could have known. I look back and wish there was something. I wish there was something that I could, that I could see and that I could learn from, that, that the next time I'm interviewing somebody, uh, and somebody with a good reputation, uh, that, that there'd be that question, that extra thing to where uh, I could find out. Because uh, personally, these, these allegations and, and these actions, he's pled guilty, um, uh, hurt personally. Uh, it hurts personally that somebody accepted a job in my office that may have committed uh, these actions. Professionally, uh, they have nothing to do with the office, uh, and, and this office is going to move forward doing its job. Let's talk about uh, what is going on with your office. You decided to sue the governor when he ordered those uh, immediate cuts to uh, colleges and universities. Uh, that decision is pending in court at this moment. The money is set aside uh, that uh, would have been realized from those cuts. Uh, he says he is the keeper of the, the budget uh, and that the money is uh, needed for the troubled pension system. You say that a governor uh, cannot affect uh, an ongoing budget if the money's coming in for that budget. Uh, Bill, uh, I don't view this as me deciding to sue the governor. I had a duty in this instance uh, to protect Kentucky's Constitution. Uh, I ran for this office to better protect seniors, uh, prosecute and prevent child abuse, uh, to find workable solutions for our drug epidemic, and seek justice for victims of rape, not to sue the governor. 
But on January 4th, when I was sworn in, I put my hand on a Bible, and I pledged to defend Kentucky's and the United States Constitution. And the governor's actions here are unconstitutional. Our Constitution is made to prevent any one person or office from having too much power. That's the bedrock principle of separation of powers. It puts certain powers in the legislative, executive, and judicial branch. The Constitution is very clear, as is every Supreme Court case on issue, that only the legislature can decide how to spend state money. The governor's argument here is, in that state budget where they fulfill their constitutional duty, the legislature only sets a ceiling, and that he and he alone as governor gets to decide how much, if any, of that money he spends where they said it needs to. What that does is it would mean the governor has the power to defund anything he wants. He could send zero dollars to public schools. He could defund the state police. Nobody has that power in the Commonwealth of Kentucky because the Constitution prohibits it. Bill, I believe I'm standing up uh, for our liberty and for the protections of our liberty. But in the end of me, I do want to say that it's not personal. Now, it sounds personal, and I can't say if it's personal or not from the other side, uh, well, but, but to me, it is doing uh, my duty. I gave the governor seven days from when he made the cuts. We provided a letter outlining why we thought it was unconstitutional. Uh, we tried to work with this administration to bring them back in line with the Constitution, but in the end, it doesn't matter what governor is in office. It's my duty to make sure that they follow the rules. Is it fair to ask, though, uh, Mr. Attorney General, even <laughs> if you're, you're saying that it's not personal, that it is to some extent political in that during your statement to the press about announcing the lawsuit, uh, you made it clear that you disagree with the priority of uh, cutting funding to higher education. I, I do, but that doesn't come to bear in the lawsuit. The lawsuit isn't about whether we should fund pensions or higher education. It's does the governor have the power to decide what to fund, when to fund, solely at his whim. Does the governor have the power to defund the state police when the legislature has provided that funding? That answer is no, but um, politically, I do greatly disagree with uh, cutting higher education, but it's legal under the current budget for the next two years. It's just not legal uh, going backwards, but let me talk about that. Uh, this governor said that he did not want to balance the budget on the backs of our children. Well, cutting higher education does just that, and we're starting to see the terrible impacts of cuts. Um, one of the community colleges is laying off over 100 people. Uh, they, they say, the CPE said the other day that tuition could go up for Murray freshmen almost 10 percent. Uh, EKU is cutting programs, including a journalism program. Moorhead State has already gone through furloughs. So this topic of higher ed, for some reason we've talked a lot about university presidents. I care a lot more about the students. And it's the students and students alone that suffer when we make these cuts, especially when we don't have to. You have also uh, issued opinions that indicate you don't think the governor has the ability to uh, remove board members, uh, the, the horse park uh, board and the, <laughs> and the retirement board and so forth. Um, uh, he told us on this program, the governor said that uh, uh, thank you for your opinion and that's all it is. Well, first, we've issued one opinion that has to do with the horse park board. Uh, we've been asked by the retirement system for an opinion on their board. We're not through that process. Uh, we've reached out to the governor's office to get their input, and we'll be putting out that opinion in the near future. But we have not made uh, any final conclusion on that. On the horse park board, I can tell you that that opinion is based on the fact that it is created to be an independent board that operates that horse park independently from uh, the executive branch and not under control of the governor. The statute states that people shall, which is a mandatory term, uh, serve a term of a specific number of years. Our issue there is if the governor can remove anyone at any time for any or no reason, it's no longer an independent board. And there was no need for the legislature to say people shall serve uh, that term. Uh, I believe in the independence of boards. When the legislature decides that we want to pull this outside of government and operate it separately, it has to operate in that way. And the governor, by a removal power, can't force any and every decision uh, that they want on it. And that's not how you've seen uh, past administrations going back 
further than just the last one, operate. Are you surprised by where the, the, the rhetoric has gone between Governor Bevan and the Bashirs? Uh, your father this week called the uh, sitting governor a bully. Uh, governor Bevan has said that there is a lot more to come out about uh, his predecessor's administration. Uh, what are people across Kentucky to think about all of this uh, rough talk? Well, first, let me address that where people disagree creates a lot of drama and gets a lot of headlines. But there have been a lot of actions uh, that I've been able to take with this administration. Uh, take the First Lady, Glenna Bevan, and my uh, effort where we have launched the most comprehensive, cohesive, statewide child abuse prevention training that this Commonwealth has ever seen. We've done three trainings of more than 18, and we've already trained over 300 people. By the end of this year, I think we're going to train more people to recognize signs of child abuse and step in than has happened over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, the First Lady and I were just at one of uh, the centers uh, that's focused on doing forensic interviews of child sexual abuse victims and also putting them on the path of treatment, uh, showing our support. Uh, the governor and I agreed and worked together uh, on the CLEP fund, on making sure that we continue uh, having Kentucky's law enforcement be some of the best trained across the country. And I think that that commitment is why you haven't seen some issues in other places uh, show up here. We've also both been very focused on seeking justice for victims of rape and ending this rape kit backlog. We both supported a bill that's going to set standards and timelines on getting things tested so it doesn't happen again. But also, I'm proud that the budget that he just signed into law includes four and a half million of settlement funds that my lawyers went out and worked hard to get. All right. that are going to the lab to make sure that this never happens again. There's some perspective on it all, but yes. as you know, the, the, yes. the tough words remain right. and the headlines remain. Right. And my question is, what are the people to make of that? Well, first, uh, a week ago, the governor did something that was unprecedented. He called a press conference and he came out and without any specifics, without any documentation, without any evidence, and without answering a single question made widespread allegations uh, as to ethics about the last administration. Now, I believe all your viewers, Bill, would agree that when somebody comes out and says those things, that you deserve uh, to make a response. And that's what uh, Governor Bashir did this week. But let's strip the politics away from it for a moment. Let's fully strip it out. We've got two governors, a past uh, and a present, uh, that are worried about things going on uh, in state government, whether past or present. Well, to me, that says, let's get down to the bottom of it. Let's find out the actual facts, but let's do it in a credible way that is not political, that is outside of either of those two folks. And there's a place that's designed to do that. And, and you have sent this to an ethics commission yes. that you're, you're, having, you're wanting them to look into. Do you, do you have a concern, and you grew up in, 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 yes. in all of this, uh, do you have concerns, though, that Kentucky has sort of a long culture of sort of... Uh, uh, you know, play to pay uh, to stay, play to play, uh, stay, <laughs> pay to play sort of thing uh, that has uh, that has long gone on uh, in, well, in in our culture. Well, I believe that the last administration set very strict ethical guidelines that were in fact um, uh, on top of uh, the ethics rules. And I know that Governor Bashir uh, came out the other day and said if people broke them, they ought to be held accountable. But any type of investigation has to be done in a credible manner. And that's why the Executive Branch Ethics Commission, which is an independent group charged under the law with doing this, is the place to do it. What lacks credibility is having the current governor, who dislikes the old governor, having his handpicked employee, who he can hire and fire, conduct that type of investigation. And it puts tremendous pressure on state employees, non-merit at-will employees who are there now. Because if someone who works for the governor that can also hire and fire them, comes and sits in their office, Bill, and says, you know, we're having a lot of problems with the last administration. We don't like them very much. And you supported them. Now, did you do that willingly? That puts tremendous pressure on that person who wants to keep their job and feed their family. I want to remove all that. I want to remove politics from it entirely. Have an independent group at it, and then come out and tell us what they found. And I'll tell you what, as Attorney General, it doesn't matter if someone has broken the law from the last administration or the current administration. If they provide us credible 
uh, information, we will take action. Attorney General Andy Bashir is our guest. We'll talk about uh, some of the actions that are going on in his office, some of his initiatives, and then Miranda Combs joins us a little later with an investigative piece on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers. Welcome back to WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers as we visit with Kentucky Attorney General Andy Bashir. Uh, there is a DNA backlog at the Kentucky State Police uh, Forensic Lab, and you say that uh, now, uh, thanks to some efforts, is being uh, addressed. Right. We, we've taken some critical steps uh, in this session. The governor deserves credit, the legislature deserves credit, and the attorney general's office uh, deserves credit. People call this the rape kit backlog, but I, I don't think that's the right way to talk about it. What it is, is it's victims of one of the worst crimes who go through and have the courage to go through one of the most invasive forensics tests. And what's happened? That courage has been locked in a box and put on a shelf and not tested. Uh, so a number of things have happened this session. Uh, first, uh, a bill was passed that'll set specific standards, time and other, to try to make sure this doesn't happen again. Second, uh, the General Assembly uh, is allowing me to use four and a half million dollars of settlement funds that came from a pharm pharmaceutical lawsuit uh, to provide to the KSP Crime Lab so that they can get the equipment and the extra people they need to make sure, again, this doesn't happen again. What that still leaves, though, Bill, is seeking justice for the people that have had those kits sitting on the shelf for way too long. So what's happening there is we have a grant from uh, the U.S. Attorney in New York to outsource some of that testing, but uh, getting that final contract approved has taken far, far too long. It is still not done, and the first kit has not been sent. That is unacceptable, and that's in the finance cabinet. They need to get that uh, going. What, what's then going to happen, though, is we're going to start getting results. And what's critical is that we move quickly to investigate and seek justice against the numerous serial rapists that testing the backlog is going to, to find. And these victims have waited far too long. So I'm pledging my full office my full support to making sure that we seek justice as fast as we can. Senate Bill number 60 was a, called yes. a continuous course of conduct law that has now been passed and signed into law. Uh, that uh, will make it simpler for uh, children mm -hmm. uh, to testify, right? This is another great example of bipartisanship. This was pushed both by me and my former opponent uh, in the Attorney General's race. It closes a loophole in child sex abuse laws uh, and does not require children under certain charges who have been abused every day, every week, in places that they should feel safe and by people that are supposed to make them uh, safe, that they don't have to pull out and testify after years of abuse, one instance of abuse that occurred on April 12th. They can now testify about that full course of conduct. And for a six-year-old, which this case that created the loophole was about, uh, this bill is absolutely necessary. There are some horrendous cases out there that we're finally going to be able to move forward thanks to this. You have collected some money for the state with various lawsuits. One of those, a settlement with Volkswagen over faked emissions tests. Well, we haven't received a settlement from Volkswagen yet. We have sued them, uh, and they are about to propose to a uh, larger group some uh, potential restitution for consumers, including Kentucky consumers. But this is exactly what the AG is supposed to do. Volkswagen claimed that they had created a clean, green diesel car. They hadn't. They created a computer that tricked regulators. Very quickly, a couple of things that you have collected on for yes. the state. Uh, Purdue Pharma, that's Oxycontin money. Uh, that's going to go to treatment centers like Chrysalis House uh, all over the Commonwealth and, and help provide more beds and more opportunities to get people better. Uh, a Risperdal lawsuit is going to put $2 million to continue the rocket docket, is going to put $4.5 million uh, to uh, make sure that that rape kit backlog uh, does not continue. We've also recovered more than $3 million to put back in the Medicaid system of fraud by providers. We are uh, very good watchdogs of those dollars. Andy Bashir, Kentucky's Attorney General, thanks for coming Thank by. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Back on WKYT's Kentucky Newsmakers in a moment. Welcome back to Kentucky Newsmakers from WKYT. WKYT's Miranda Combs leads our investigative efforts and looks into all kinds of interesting stories. You benefit from that, seeing it on our newscasts. This week, she had an attention getter when she revealed that a 10-year-old was helping his dad, who's a local sheriff, with some of his duties. A true take-your-son-to-work day. Miranda's uh, here now to kind of set this up for us and tell us a little bit about, uh, about the story. Well, Bill, this is a sheriff in Clinton County who likes to spend a lot of 
of time with his son. That involves taking his son to work, apparently, especially on this day that we focus in on. But there's something that happens that takes it a little bit too far and has caused a lot of controversy among a lot of our viewers. So, All right. Well, I want to ask you a little bit about that and the okay. feedback we've gotten and so forth. But let's take a look at the story. Well, y'all been this is Guffy before. That sheriff, Jim Guffy. And this was the end of our interview. Sheriff Guffey is the top police officer of Clinton County, population just over 10,000. The courthouse sits in the middle of Albany, a typical small Kentucky town where lunch breaks are common. Hi, how are you? And visits from reporters aren't. This piece of paper is what brought us here. This is the Clinton County Jail admission and release form. Check out the signature at the bottom, though, of the arresting or transporting officer. This isn't the sheriff or his deputies. This is a 10 year old. We had some concerns from some people in your county okay. about this. Okay. Who is that? That's my son. That's your son? Yeah. And so is he a deputy or? No, he's not a deputy. We were emailed this form showing Sheriff Guffey's son's signature on an official jail document. We were also emailed this picture who Sheriff Guffey confirms is his son. Is this your son? Yes, it is. And so you had him dress up like he is a sheriff's deputy? Ma'am, that's kids' clothes. There's nothing real on his person. What time was it? Oh, it was about 8 30, 9 o'clock in the morning. LaDonna Kempton was one of the women arrested on March 5th by Sheriff Guffey with his son in tow. He was dressed just like a, a deputy. Had a taser, had a badge. Had a taser? Yes. You're sure? Yeah. Showed it to me. Sure did. Yeah. On his side, just like the sheriff did. We interviewed Kempton in the Russell County Detention Center where she is awaiting trial for her charges out of Clinton County. What are your charges? What are you facing? I'm facing, yeah, it could be five years or more. I don't know exactly how long. All drug charges, a felony, and two misdemeanors were the warrant she was served on March 5th. She says the sheriff's son was with his dad the entire time but didn't participate in the arrest until they got to the jail. And the sheriff's son took over for signing her in. Did you see his son sign it? Yeah, I witnessed his son sign it. They, they all just thought it was, they thought it was funny, like it was a big trick for this kid to be doing this. This is a copy of another intake form that we were emailed from the same day as Kempton's arrest. We followed up by asking the jail for the same copy. The one they faxed us, though, is different. It's got transported by Sheriff Guffey added to the side. This is Clinton County Jailer Johnny Thrasher. This was the original, and then... This one says, when it was faxed to me, it says transported by Jim Guffey. I don't know anything about that either. We need to change it. He says he wasn't there the day Guffey's son came in. If you were here, would you let his son sign an intake form? If I'd have been here, it probably wouldn't have happened. But I wouldn't hear it. The jailer says it's not routine. In fact, he's never seen the sheriff's son in the jail. The sheriff says after our initial calls, he checked with the county judge and other county officials who told him there's nothing wrong with what he did. None of them returned our calls. I haven't done nothing criminal. I have not given, put my child in harm's way. So if you're this desperate for a story for your television station, then so be it. But you had him sign an official document, an intake form at the jail. A lot of times they don't get signed by officers. So that makes it okay that your okay. nine-year-old son so, did it? So you, you want to degrade me by doing this? Then go ahead. It's not degrading. I'm just asking the question of why I, you would I just allow told him to you, do it. I just told you. I don't put my son in harm's way. You know, somebody needs to know that they've got this nine-year-old kid serving indictment. This is taking it to another level. I'm done. Okay? okay. Okay. Well, I appreciate you talking to us. I mean, this is ridiculous. Sir, cut the camera off, please. And with that, he walked out. Well, y'all been with Mr. Gubb before. Dad protecting his son, his job though, to protect the county. And that's how it ended. Mm -hmm. uh, social media gives us a lot of instant feedback these days, and mm -hmm. we've had a lot, and it's uh, very mixed with what uh, people are saying. Oh, absolutely. The sheriff obviously has a great following. He was voted in, and so he has supporters, and, and they're definitely letting me know how they feel about this story. But there's also people that are concerned that the sun is going along. Right now, police are targets in this country a lot of times, so that's a very dangerous place for his son to be. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So I would say overall, the comments have been balanced. 
but tough. <laughs> Did he give you any indication that he feels there is no uh, danger to, to his son? Oh, he situation? told me over and over yeah. again, and especially in that case, he said, you know, I was serving warrants mm -hmm. that morning. I was not serving actual arrest because a crime was happening. He said that made it okay, but LaDonna Kempton even admitted in our interview, she said, what if I would have been high that morning? What if something else would have, what if somebody else would have been in my house that was high? Anything can happen at any given time on any given job. How did you find out about that story? Well, we got emailed an anonymous tip with the intake form with the son's signature on it and a picture of the son. So I followed up and called the jail and got them to fax me those same intake forms. So when I got that, that's when we thought we needed to take a trip down to Clinton County. Did you have an appointment with him or did you just walk in? No, I walked in. He was in court, which was upstairs from there. I asked for him to come down. I got the strong feeling he knew why we were there. He invited us into his office and we started the conversation and it went well for a while I mean, until I kept pushing on the whole issue of why his son would sign and then he, w he was done with the interview. How often do your stories uh, come from tips that you go and investigate? I'd say about 25% of the time and I'd say it's that low because when we get tips, which we do get a lot, mm -hmm. we also need the documents, uh, pictures, a location, something that can help us move forward with it. Not that we won't do our own work, but we need a starting point. So that this story was one of those that worked to our favor with a tip. And then you have to decide, is the story worth the effort to investigate and so forth? And then uh, really uh, an entire team here uh, looks over, considers all of the, uh, the the ethics involved and uh, other issues. And Bill, you're the one that takes the lead on that. This has to affect a lot of people. And when you take, when you're talking about a sheriff, any elected official, that obviously is going to affect a wide margin of people in our viewing area. And that's one of the reasons that this story in particular was so important for us to cover because this is your elected official. If uh, people do have uh, story ideas, let you know. Absolutely. All right, Miranda Combs, our investigative reporter at WKYT. We want to thank you for joining us for this. This edition of Kentucky Newsmakers. We certainly hope you make it a good week ahead.